Hello and welcome to episode 256 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans Off Topic Weekly Podcast. I'm Mike Solosi, and today we are going to break your hearts and confuse and confound you and probably die in the end, because this episode is all about traitors and betrayals. The If you know this TV show that the uh, that the title quote comes from, then I like you more than I did before. But let's talk about four people who I already do like quite a bit, starting with Zach Wilkerson. Hi there. And Nathan Lee. Hello, everyone. And Alana Hagues. Hey, everyone. And making her podcast debut, Nikki Fakuri. Hello. So, I'm here with four people from the, the RPG Fan Reviews crew, total coincidence, but uh, we're not here to talk about reviews or any game in particular. We want to talk about betrayals. Um, like, a, a betrayal or a real dark character turn is the kind of plot twist that is, I don't know, memorable or even legendary. Like, it, it's almost become an internet joke, uh, top ten anime betrayals. I think it's... Very doable to have an entire podcast episode on them. Uh, so, uh, starting with you, Alana, what's something about a betrayal plot twist that, you know, you, something that you think makes a good one or is particularly interesting about them? Um, I mean, I think the thing I like about them is that a lot of the time when you play games with friends, it's really fun to try and work out who it might be and... I'm a big fan of the Tales games, and that's always kind of the draw of them, is like, oh no, which one's going to betray you? Um, <laughs> but generally, like, I've always really loved them because I think when they're done really well, they can really flip the script on things, and it gives you a chance to, like, reassess that character and kind of reassess everything that's happened over the past 20 hours, and, like, you can really deep dive into them, and there are sometimes some really interesting reasons for them going, turning their back on you, and... I like studying characters, so it's a really fun chance to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of digging them out and sometimes not digging them out and just trying to figure out why they're doing it. I, I definitely know a thing or two about looking at a character and in the first minute thinking, well, you're going to die or turn evil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Nathan, what do you look for in a good video game trader? Like, it gives you a chance to reevaluate that character was like, a un- like it allows you to replay the game and kind of look for like the kind of tells that that they had throughout the game as to when and how they're going to betray. So, uh, Zach, one thing that Nathan said was looking for tells, and and especially when re-experiencing a game, and that that strikes me as foreshadowing. Um, <laughs> and as as an English educator, how important is foreshadowing to plot twists like like betrayals? <laughs> I you know I think foreshadowing is important, uh, of course. Um, and I but I think that the thing that sticks out to me about it is like if they have a good reason to do it. Um, mm-hmm. and I there is one on on our list that I will definitely call early. Um, but for me, I'm always engaged by characters who still. Um, are like decent humans after they after they do it in their own way, um, and it kind of goes along with what Alana and Nathan were saying as well. But you know, um, people who are still engaging in ways like not for reasons of being evil, but for reasons of like how does your version of good differ from my version of good? Right on. And Nikki, uh, we've talked about foreshadowing. We talked about uh, like how these are among the most exciting kinds of plot twists. What what do you think is the difference between a betrayal or a big character turn being earned versus not feeling right? I feel like if it's not extreme enough, it doesn't feel as earned. Either it has to be someone that you really hated from the beginning, so it's satisfying to be proven right and then go and kick them in the shins later, or you had to have really loved them and um, like you were already saying, you know, they're justified in their betrayal, but that makes it hurt all the more. So then you have a big sad. Yeah. The loved one is the one I suffer from too many times on this list, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm going over this list that we have. We're working off of a uh, off of a Google Doc that has at least 20 entries on it. We're not going to get to all 20. Um, but uh, for, the, for the rest of the bones of this podcast, we're going to basically just take turns talking about games or individual traders and uh and just talk about what we like and dislike about each of them and uh you know just just have fun talking about uh or getting our hearts broken 
And uh, it goes without saying that there's going to be a lot of spoilers in this episode. Like, character turns and betrayals are as spoilery as spoilers get. So we're going to try and provide a warning, a spoiler warning, but before every single game we talk about. Like, uh, we're not going to go, okay, Final Fantasy IV, how about that cane? Um, which <laughs> definitely just breaks the rule I just established. <laughs> but we're, we're going to try and do a pause in between each one. Uh, in, in case you, the listener, don't know every single RPG that's ever been made and maybe want to avoid spoilers, I understand. So let's just get on with the list. Um, you know what? I already said it. Let's talk about Final Fantasy first. Uh, because for, for me, at least the first video game trader I remember encountering was Kane from Final Fantasy mm-hmm. 4. Mm-hmm. And this series has a lot, a, a lot going ahead. So, all right. Um, spoilers for every Final Fantasy game other than 4 going here on out. Okay! So, uh, <laughs> Kane leaves your party or mysteriously disappears only to return or betrays you straight up. I want to say three and a half or four times in FF4. That sounds, sounds about right. right. Yeah. And as a result, it feels like you never should trust him, but also makes him the coolest character in the game because of how of how cool and unpredictable he is. He is the coolest character in the game. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I uh, might have my Final Fantasy fourteen character main for a reason. <laughs> I mean, the FF14 Dragoons may all look exactly like Kane for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that the thing I love about Kane, I mean, he betrays you over and over again because he's controlled by Golbez, of course. Um, but I also like that the whole subtext with Rosa um, throughout the course of the game right. um, and how that is never like the reason for his betrayal, that he loves Rosa, but that he is able, like, it, it, like Golbez is able to, like, pull that out of him and make that his reason for it, I think. I mean, it's never made it 100% clear, even in any of the versions that I've played. And I've played all the versions of Final Fantasy IV. <laughs> um, but I love that there is that little subtext to him. Yeah, well. I think it's the inner darkness in him that uh, that he's jealous of Cecil in love with Rosa, maybe resentful of uh, of, of what Cecil has, um, that... That sort of allows Golbez to get inside his head and betray him because there's there's at least a kernel of Cain uh, wanting to fight Cecil, uh, like for the, for him to to exploit. And it, it's not always clear in the text of the game, but what is extremely clear in the text of the game is that Cain will leave and fight you and rejoin you and leave again a bunch of times. So what else in the, in the Final Fantasy series uh, do we think? qualifies for our list. And I don't, I don't want to get too granular over what counts as a traitor or not. Like, as long as they're a important NPC or a player character that does a surprising character turn that has them at least working against the heroes for part of the game. That, that That's that's enough. I mean, does Cat She even qualify as a surprising betrayal? <laughs> oh, he definitely does, doesn't okay. he? I just mean, it's like a... It's been so long, um, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, it, yeah. it's a lot of the I mean, blue when he joins your party, but he, he's been with you right. so long that it is a little bit surprising that he straight up steals an important item from you and hands it to the enemy. Exactly. But then, like, within, what, hours, he sacrifices himself to save you because, well, you know, he can, he's disposable. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I know that Kat She is the right way to say it, but I'm, I'm still going to say Kate Sith just because just because I'm a moron <laughs> whose brain hasn't quite left 1997. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, the betrayal is there, but I'm, I'm not sure if it was that shocking or interesting enough because he rejoins you right afterwards. Yeah. And sacrifices himself right afterwards. And then right after that, he comes back in a new body like nothing happened. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess Reeve, who is operating Cat She in the background, I'm going to be annoying and say it the right way the whole time. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> he's the one who's trying to leave Shinra because he doesn't agree with what they're doing to the planet and how they're harnessing the planet's energy, right? So, like... You know, Katshi deceives you, but at the same time, Reeve is also struggling with this idea that actually, no, I don't want to, I want to work with Cloud and the party because they're doing the right thing. So it looks like Katshi, Kate Sith, is betraying the party, but really it's Reeve betraying Shinra and joining the party. So it's like a, it's like, it's like a double turn. Kind of, but the Black Materia is handed over for that, for the reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bad reason. 
Now that's a character uh, we saw a little bit of Reeve, but nothing of of Ketchy in uh, in FF Seven Remake. And so when we get FF Seven Remake the second in year TBD, I'm really interested to see how they handle that character because I, I mean script he, he was scripted annoying 23 years ago and. I mean, with, with a script as good as the remakes was, with his voice acting, with voice acting as thorough as it was, I gotta see how they treat that character. That's gonna be really interesting. I mean, are they gonna keep him Scottish? That's the real thing. <laughs> from from compilation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Can we get Leona to audition, or is it too late? I don't know. I think it might be mm. a bit late. That's a shame. So we have Final Fantasy Tactics on this list too, and Zach, I'm curious. Do we want to, do we want to talk about Delita or talk about Gafgarion or everyone? <laughs> everyone. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, uh, Argaf. I mean, oh so yeah. yeah. Oh shoot, him. Is oh. Also, I mean, I think it, he he is like a pure evil traitor, um, but like he he betrays you because he thinks you're betraying the cause. So that makes Argath sort of interesting on that front. But yeah, but his cause is um, supporting the nobility in a class struggle, and also a little bit of racism thrown in. Uh, right. So I, I mean, I mean, I mean Nikki, <laughs> Nikki said at the beginning of the episode that the, uh, some of the best traitors are ones that are satisfying to finally take down. And Argath, which is who was called Algus in the old translation of FF Tactics, oh man, like it's like hearing that blood curdling ff tactic scream when you finally kill him is just the best that's great but i think the ultimate traitor but not really traitor which is my favorite kind of traitor is delita <laughs> it's exactly what you were talking about earlier it's the we are yeah. you know means to justify an end isn't it who what's the right kind of it's his kind of justice like it's his kind of revenge on the world for what happened to his sister how the people treat the commoners and everything and it's just you know, the only way I'm going to do it is by changing the system inside out and getting to the top myself. And I'll do whatever I have to do to get there. And yeah, yeah. he's amazing. Oh, my God. He's an incredible character. D- Delita yeah. is one of the all time great uh, Final Fantasy characters. But I mean, he's almost more manipulator than traitor. Yeah, uh, because he yeah. he sort of betrays Ramza's group. Ramza is the main character. Uh, and starts going off on his own thing. It looks like he's working for one side of the nobility fighting, but then betrays them. And it turns out he's been working with this underground, these underground temple knights for the whole time. But then he betrays them and sort of sets Rams's group against the temple knights for them to sort of just destroy each other. And then he, uh, marries the princess and becomes King at the end of the game. (laughs) It, in it, it's, it's some pretty amazing, uh, political machinations that, uh, dealt that Delita, uh, does but I, I'm not like he definitely betrays people. I'm not sure if he ever betrays Ramza though, because sort of to the end he's counting on Ramza to uh, d- to beat the Temple Knights and save the world, and he helps him at times. It's it, it's a really complicated, interesting friendship that they have. Yeah, well, that's like the most interesting kind of story, isn't it? Like I don't think I'd like it if it was just a black and white. Oh, I'm going to betray you, Ramza, but you know, instead, in fact, he like manipulates. He's friends with Ramza and wants him to survive but at the end of the day he's still using him as a stepping stone to get to where he wants to get right like it's just it's it's nasty but he does it and you're kind of rooting yeah. for him yeah he's he's a he's a manipulator yeah I, I think he's definitely a manipulator but i think that ramza would do what he's doing regardless probably yes. um i'm not sure that uh, the delita is really pressing him that way he just i think that delita is just so much smarter than everyone else oh, yeah. that he recognizes what ramza is doing and he's like okay let me see that see what my friend is doing as being something that is righteous and i'm gonna play off of that and he's just like sort of sitting over it. i mean like he betrays other people certainly the princess he betrays her uh, pretty badly but um he yeah he he, he is master manipulator but um, I, I think with Ramza in particular, he's not really manipulating Ramza. He's trying to say like, hey, just like, let me do my thing. Yeah, a little bit. All right. So hmm, I don't want to stick uh, too long in any one topic. So I think we're ready to move on. Uh, Nathan, what, what what is a game or series whose traders we should discuss next? Well, since Fire Emblem's already on the list, why don't we go with that? Okay. Sure. Now, um, I, I guess we're talking about Fire Emblem Path of Radiance with the the whole Black Knight situation, right? Well, we could talk about that too, but I was thinking more radio down how, like, I'm not sure like, like you really call it a trade, but t- how often Jill is able to switch if sides. If I remember correctly, thing. Jill is the only Fire Emblem character who can permanently leave your party and you have to kill her if she speaks to her father. 
Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And you also have uh, Nasala selling out the Herons um, and Sephirin, everything with Sephirin. Yep. Um, it's a wild ride. <laughs> yeah, the Talia's games are basically like, I don't want to call it Game of Thrones with, with my intrigue that happens, but there's a lot of political stuff that happens. Yeah, in, I've played Patch of games. Radiance, but not That's Radiant so Dawn. And it, my understanding is Radiant Dawn really, like, the, the story sort of explodes, but some of the maps are terrible and, and there's weird difficulty spikes. But, uh, but, but, but Fire Emblem fans mostly defend it still. Yeah. yeah Radiant Dawn was like, like, I was, I say it every single time, I call it a puzzle game in SRPG form because I feel like if you don't make the right moves, then you just lose characters. It just feels that way sometimes. And so the maps are just gigantic, like, it takes like 10 turns to get across the whole map. 100 enemies sometimes, I remember a couple of maps. But, uh, anyway, I, I remember, like, I remember talking about, uh, Fire Island Path, or, sorry, Raiding Down with someone else recently, and I think, I can't remember how many times that Jill swapped sides in, in the game, because she's torn between, uh, staying with her friends from, I, I, from the mercenaries, but then also influenced by the new faction, the Dawn Brigade. So she, she ends up like, like flip flopping back and forth if you talk to her with certain characters. That's weird. Yeah. I've played, um, six or seven different Fire Emblem games. I don't remember any other situation like that. Uh, almost every Fire Emblem game has something called the Navar character, who, who's named after the uh, Fire Emblem One version of this. But Navar almost uh, okay. Navar always starts as a member of the enemy army, but if you talk to them with a certain character before they accidentally kill themselves, they join your party, which is almost a not exactly a, a betrayal to the player, but a, a version of betrayal. <laughs> like, like every Fire Emblem game, you gain a traitor from the other side. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's true, yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like... Yeah, it, it's Gee in Fire Emblem 7 and Joshua in Fire Emblem 8. Oh, boy, I'd have to check a list to properly identify them all. But I, I haven't played a new Fire Emblem game since... Uh, since... Yeah, since Fate, which is probably something I'd rather forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see, Echoes had... Uh, you can get Sonya or... Uh, I think Dean. It was, it, was it Jesse? I think you could get from... Hmm. I always preferred Jesse to Dean in the uh, in the Fire Emblem Gilmore Girls edition. <laughs> uh, well, Three Houses has has a few too. Like I feel like even if you don't like recruit them before before the uh, first half of the game, you can still get them later because the game will just be like, oh, you defeated them with with, with uh, main character, so you, you can have a chance yeah, but, to beat them. Is that really a betrayal? Uh, this is not not important. Fire Emblem has a lot of characters, and sometimes they're traitors. <laughs> but, but especially, especially Jill, it seems, because uh, I, I, I think I remember Jill from Path of Radiance, but she didn't really have any indication that she would be a, a, a multiple turncoat just from just from the text of that game. Am I am I remembering it wrong? Because it's it's been a decade. When Jill starts out, she's a uh, pretty racist towards the Lagoose because that's how she was brought up. But um, you know, through interactions with the rest of the army and in base conversations, she learns. Um, you know, to overcome that. And she realizes that, you know, she was wrong, but that still affects her because her father is still on the opposing side, which is why you don't want her to talk to her dad, because in the end, she still really loves her father and she will turn on you if you give her that opportunity. Ooh, okay. Yeah, you, you did mention that before, but that's an interesting angle, huh? Her her father wasn't in Path of Radiance though. This is all Radiant Dawn. No, that's Path of Radiance. That's you Path have to Radiance? kill him no matter what. Oh damn. Oh. Okay, I mean, maybe I should replay Path of Radiance because it, it it I played that thing in the late two thousands and I don't remember all of it apparently. <laughs> that's okay. I don't remember most games I've played a few months ago, so you're fine. I'm at least able to remember fin Final Fantasy games that I played twenty five years ago. That's something, I guess. I feel like you remember games from your youth. It also helps that I've played Final Fantasy IV like every time it gets released <laughs> in a new, on a new system. You've which got is, more opportunities. Uh, which is, what, eight, Fire eight Emblem times? wasn't stuck. Or those two games weren't stuck on the Wii and the GameCube and like a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars yeah. each. I think you know yep. they'd be more yeah, accessible. Geez, they're, yeah, the, they're both rare now. I mean, that's that sounds like a double pack Switch port if I've ever if I've ever heard one. Exactly. Ooh. That's right, Nintendo. Let's go. Oh, I'm sure Nintendo listens to this podcast. For sure. 
Yeah, good old uh, Bobby Nintendo he listens to Retro Encounter every week. <laughs> Takes all of our advice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Um, Zach, what's another gamer series we should cover? Oh, we all know what I'm going to talk about, right? Uh, is, it, is it Lunar? <laughs> yep. Sweep it in. Oh, never mind. Okay, that was my second guess. <laughs> I mean, I might go there later. Okay! Um, you know, and I, I, I feel bad to talk about some of these because I know some of you haven't played some of the later sequeting, sequeting games. So we'll start, t- we'll start with the first two and we'll see where we go from there. Um, I mean, I feel like, um, Suikoden 2 has, in my opinion, and I'm very biased, uh, my favorite trader was Joey. Um, yeah. and he's really, I, I know that Joey and Delita get compared a lot and I am guilty of that comparison quite frequently. I think it's a fair, it's a, it's a fair comparison because of the kinds of characters each of them are, but it, it, I mean, they're, but they're both excellent. And if anything, Joey is slightly like Dark Delita. Yeah, I mean, he he mm-hmm. he genuinely betrays you, um, and he tries to murder you at some point. Like he does not have, unlike Delita, he doesn't have your best interests or your interests or your cause in mind once he betrays you. Um, but he still has his own cause that I think is, even though I disagree with it, and I think we as the player disagree with him as well that is worthy of consideration and worthy of thought, you know, in terms of like gathering people together as, as like a Highland kingdom. So I I think that his betrayal is also heavily foreshadowed as we talked about earlier, but it's also really shocking how he does it um, Mm -hmm. by murdering um, Annabelle is her name, right? Gosh, I can't believe I'm asking that question. Yeah, right? yeah, ma- yeah, is, the, yeah, yeah, the mayor of that uh, the, the large um, walled city. Muse, Muse, Muse yeah. that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it also maybe is the one that hurts the most on this list for me. Like, mm-hmm. you've Agreed. already got the um, character dynamic between Rio, Nanami, and Joey built up so much, and you can see them as a family unit so strong. So to have the like older sibling, well, he's not older anyway, but um, like to have him do that. Like, it breaks Nanami's heart, and she tries to bring him back multiple times. And, of course, you've got little Pelika as well, who's the little girl that you rescue from the village that's burnt down at the beginning, which I can't remember the name of. But she, every time she sees Joey... There? Yes, that's it. Um, so every time she sees Joey, she, like, completely loses it, and is like, oh, Joey, and Uncle Joey! And it's like, oh, my God, every time it gets me. Yeah, especially since um, following the destruction of her uh, village, she has been sort of traumatized into total muteness. So, mm-hmm. like, seeing her come alive again in the presence of Joey when he's no longer fighting on the same side as you just makes the whole Joey Rio Pilica situation more more heart wrenching. And yeah, um, Zach was talking about the causes at odds here. Like in FF Tactics, Delita wanted um, the basically wanted the current monarchy and nobility to fall and then take over as a new king that would be just towards the poor and do the right thing. Well, in this one, it's more that Joey joins the evil invaders because he thought they had the best chance to win and could restore order. Like, like he's more yeah. in favor of order versus in favor of justice or doing what's right. And he's willing to defeat, kill, even massacre uh, the, you know, the, the quote unquote good guys of Suikoden 2 to achieve those ends, which is like... Again, similar goals to Delita, because he wants to sort of take over and make the world a better place, but a much darker, much uh, more, you know, identifiably evil version of what Delita does. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, Joey um, certainly, he he gets forgiveness from the game that I'm not sure that I would give him, <laughs> um, if you get the true <laughs> ending um, as a result. And so I, I certainly think that, it, and in the true ending, he does something evil there too. Um, he abandons Jillio. <laughs> um, yeah. And he, he could have laid down his arms earlier once he recognizes it. So he becomes consumed by the reason that he moves to the other side in a way that he had to know by the end wasn't in his best interest, but he kept pushing forward with it anyway. And I think that is the distinction. Delita is a thousand times smarter than Joey, even though Joey is very smart, um, which makes him, I think, um, maybe more tragic in some ways. I'm I'm mad at Joey because in the true ending, instead of bringing along Pilika and, uh, and and the princess with them as they ride off into the sunset, he leaves them alone. Yep. That, right. Why couldn't Pilika join them? Why? Why? I, I, I'm still upset about it. <laughs> um... 
so so Zach, who besides Joey do we want to discuss from this weekend end series? I you know I'm going to leave five off the table because I feel like some of you deserve to experience that for yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sincere. I <laughs> edited I, this weekend in one. I, I edited this weekend in five episodes, so I, I think I know who you're referring to. But we can go to weekend in one instead. Uh, we could talk about Suikoden and one instead. I mean, Pawn, I think, is a great... I, I think that Suikoden does traders really well. Um, because mm-hmm. Su- the Suikoden 5 trader, I won't name the person, um, for those of you who haven't played yet, because I just know you want to. <laughs> um, but that, yeah. that particular character does a phenomenal job of having a great reason for betrayal. And Suikoden 1, I think, it's not as complex as Joey or the Suikoden 5 trader, but I think that Pawn who betrays you in Suikoden 1, um, has a reason. I mean, it's because he's loyal to your father. Because those of you who haven't played Suikoden 1, um, you play Tur McDole, who is the son of one of the five great generals of, um, it's called the Scarlet Moon Empire. Um, and Pawn is one of your friends, um, and you eventually sort of betray the Empire because you think it's evil, and then Pawn betrays you to um, General McDole. Um, and so I think that he is, um, a character who you have compassion for in that situation. And I think that sweep it in all of them. I mean, all of them have traitors, but the three best ones are one, two and five, um, of <laughs> having just phenomenal reasoning behind why they go against you. And I actually think that Joey is the most evil of the three of those people. Alana, I know you've played Suikoden 1. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd actually sort of forgotten a little bit, unfortunately. Oh, all right, fair enough. <laughs> I know. Suikoden Trader is good. And it's not, it's, I mean, Joey is the big highlight trader from Suikoden 2, but there's a lot of different organizations and people within them betraying each other. Like the, like a, that uh, Northern Kingdom that sort of becomes a surprise villain in the last few hours of the game when normally when when they had been neutral for most of the game and just two of their generals Armonia? yeah 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 I think so and two and uh, two of their generals betrayed their king to join you only for that kingdom to like do something unforgivable right near the end of the game <laughs> but it's oh matilda matilda yeah yeah okay i was thinking yeah. of matilda but but it, it's 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 not just as easy as this as joey betrays you it's more that people are betraying each other a lot all the time and and then there are uh but but joey is sort of the like the, the highlight one from suikoden 2 yeah unfortunately none of these betrayals really match the title of this episode uh, they're not really anime betrayals <laughs> <laughs> anime is not nuanced. anime is not in the title but uh but top 10 anime betrayals <laughs> oh. is you know a phrase you get thr- movie, you, you've yes. seen thrown around a lot <laughs> it is yeah so nikki i don't think you've chosen one yet uh what's something from the list that we absolutely have to discuss Oh, I think you know. Oh. It's a Bravely Default, Where the mm-hmm. Fairy Flies. Okay! All right, now, I'm going to start this off saying that Where the Fairy Flies is the uh, English title, and Flying Fairy was the Japanese title. And in, in both versions, if you hang on the, the, uh, to the title screen for a few extra seconds, some of the words fade out. And in the English version, it says "airy lies," and in the Japanese version, it says "lying airy." Whoa! Because oh, no. there's a like, like you could say the Navi of this game uh, is a little fairy that accompanies your party named Airy, and Airy is you know encouraging, telling you, "Oh, we need to go to this crystal. We need to do this next," and it's just being oh, no. it's just uh, being a very encouraging little happy fairy for most of the game. But uh, Nikki, what what happens exactly? Um, she, she's like a, I don't remember the exact details, but listen, she's just bad. She's bad. She's lying to you. She's, she wants, uh, to, what is it? Bring back the, the Ouroboros guy to kill Mm -hmm. everybody, to destroy all the universes. Hungry Snake wants to eat all the universes. And Aerie wants, uh, for Hungry Snake to eat all the universes. She's not nice. She's very bad. Uh, agreed. Uh, and to bring some extra clarity, because this is a game I was obsessed with for a month right when I got my 3DS for the first time. Uh, Bravely Default is a world with multiple universes or multiple dimensions. And when you think you've 
solve the problem and by dis- I, I, it's either destroying or activating all the crystals. I forget which. Uh, it, you it sort of takes you back to the beginning of the game again, and that and I mean Tiz and the other main characters are like, hey, what gives? This this is strange. We've already done all this, and uh, every time and it makes you do that three times. You have to repeat certain parts of the plot. Uh, not every single detail that, that happened, like, like the very first run before the, before restarting is like more than half of the game. Um, but there's a part where you have to visit all the crystal dungeons and repeat parts of the plot, I think four times in a row. And it looks like, and the reason of this is because what you're doing is actually sort of ending one universe and beginning in a new one, which is Aerie's goal from the beginning. Aerie wants you to sort of it, Aerie has been guiding heroes through every single universe until you get down to universe zero so her boss, Ouroboros, can sort of consume every single universe at once and then begin the world uh, in his own image or something. But the crazy part is, is at the beginning of the game, like, Aerie's wings have a design on them that looks like a five, and every time you go to a new universe, the number, a, a different number is on Aerie's wings. <laughs> So if you, if you pay attention in the menus of the game and in cutscenes where Aerie is present, you can sort of see yourself counting down until the final conflict. It's it's wild. It, it, again, like I mean, I use the comparison Navi from uh uh from Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time. It's like if Navi ended up being the special agent of Ganon the whole time. Oh my god! I actually had no idea that Bravely Default. I knew it was meta to a degree because I knew about the replaying bits but i didn't get far enough i got a third of the way through and sort of gave up um but i had no idea the fairy on the front cover was airy what i'd forgotten that i was like what and, and also at the end um, maybe my favorite part of the ending sequence of bravely default is uh basically wait, while you're fighting a Roboros, it help it's like heroes from all of the universes that have been linked together are going to help you and it goes into your friends list and and their bravely their bravely default characters from alternate universes like all uh, encourage you and and fight with you in the final battle. That's quite cool, actually. Yeah, it, it goes into your friends list and I think also your street pass list. I, I don't have so, many friends on my 3ds, so <laughs> oh well. For me, it, it was a bunch of random street passes from magfests of years past. I think is what is what is what a lot of it came from. But uh, yeah, a hell of a traitor, and maybe my favorite part of it. Uh, and you, I hope you can attest to this, Nikki, is when you finally get to fight Aerie, hours, like, after playing the game for 60 plus hours, and at least 10 hours after you realize she's evil, you finally get to fight her and shut her down, and she has special boss music that is one of the best tracks in the whole game. Wicked Flight. Yeah, Wicked Flight, that's a good that one. That song rules. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like nine minutes, but a whole eight and a half of them are bangers. So yeah, sorry if we uh, inadvertently spoiled uh, a big part of Bravely Default for everyone, but that betrayal and that end game and meta commentary is kind of why the game is awesome and just goes beyond being a Final Fantasy V like uh, like random battle class changing game. Well, that's what makes it interesting, right? I remember when uh, when the game was first announced for Japan, and it had the uh, uh, flying fairy uh, subtitle everyone was like oh ff because it's like final fantasy but if you take away the two f's what are you left with lying because it's not final fantasy right mm-hmm. oh, man. Yeah, even, even the title is a clever meta commentary on our on rpgs <laughs> so uh, alana if you're if you have if your brain's recovered from having its mind blown uh <laughs> what's a, a, a suggestion for a game or series we should discuss next well i'm gonna make a link because ouroboros seems to have come up so i think it's time to talk oh. about the trails series mm-hmm. okay um we'll start from first chapter because i think first chapter is the beginning and really the end game of trails in the sky first chapter is where the betrayal becomes kind of apparent. So for most of the game, you're just Estelle and Joshua traveling, LeBurl, doing bracer jobs, but it becomes apparent early on that there is some like political ongoings. There's uh, this group of Jaegers going around. There's a mysterious organization, but then you get to Grand Sol, which is the capital city. And you find out that uh, the leader of the intelligence division, who has popped up a few times to kind of take his glory, um, Colonel Alan Richard is trying to overthrow the castle and is trying to take over 
Um, he's being manipulated by Ouroboros in the background. I don't think you find that out until second chapter because they're not revealed yeah. until second chapter, correct? Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Ouroboros is the secret organization that is behind all of the wrongdoing in every Trails game from 2004 to present day. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, Alan Richard is... He's basically tricked into it because he's told that something will happen and if you don't act upon this, then, you know, you'll you'll lose the country or you will go into war again or something like that. I don't remember the specifics, but they basically tricked him into using his honour in a different way. Um, I think, I mean, to spoil later games, Colonel Richard does get a redemption arc in the third specifically, um, and he does pop up at the end of second chapter, if I remember correctly. Um I think he's an interesting character. I don't think that first chapter gives him his dues because he kind of just pops up here and again. And it's like, oh, you're so cool. Um, but um, yeah, no, no, I, he, he's not. He's not even the third traitor we want to talk about for trails. <laughs> we're, 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 this this is ongoing. Oh no, definitely. This series has a few of them, and um, Zero and Owl have some as well. But I haven't played those games yet, so I'm not going to go into any of them. Uh, but now we can we can stick to Sky and Cold Steel because what happens at the end of like after you defeat Alan Richards' group, what happens at the end of first chapter? Oh god, yeah, this is a major spoiler. So there's a cliffhanger mm-hmm. ending. So mute for a bit if you don't want to hear it. Or skip ahead. Uh, you go and get ice cream for Joshua, and Joshua's sitting there, and there's this professor who's been following you around the country for the whole game, and he suddenly does a full fail, uh, face heel turn and reveals himself to be one of the highest members of Ouroboros, this secret organization that you've only just found out about called Weissman, and he's the third Anguis, I want to say, or the second Anguis? Um, I think he's the second Anguis. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and uh, Ouroboros is led by a Grandmaster, and then seven sub-commanders called Anguises, and then a bunch of special agents called Enforcers. 21. There's 21 for the Tower um, deck. Right, okay. Um, yes, so Wiseman, you find out that Wiseman has actually had a mind spell on Joshua, and Joshua ended up in the care of the uh, Bright family when he tried to assassinate Cassius Bright. Um, he was kept by Cassius Bright to try and kind of look after him and nurture him but secretly joshua was planted there as a spy and was secretly giving information back to ouroboros the whole time without realizing it and wiseman shows him his past and all of this to him and joshua leaves in a dramatic fashion shall we say after finding this out this is a very very redacted version of it but it's Mm -hmm. it's 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 tough to watch put it that way yeah but seeing joshua betray estelle and the reveal that Professor Alba is this evil Ouroboros guy named Weissman uh, is 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 huge, and um, it's mostly resolved because like you defeat Weiss- Weissman at the end of uh, of Sky Two, and uh, Joshua and Estelle reconcile. But the re- the chain combo reveals that Alan Richard is behind the coup in the capital city, and that Alba was an Ouroboros Anguis and jo- Joshua was an Ouroboros Enforcer, and and they might and uh and they might be the central villains of the next game is just completely wild and only matched in wildness by everything that happens in in, in Cold Steel. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. I think um at the very least the portrayal in Cold Steel is way more telegraphed, I think if you're a li- it's not like it's not obs- Which one? Oh, well, I'm talking about the main one. Yeah, yeah <laughs> yes. I, okay, I figured. Yeah. Uh, one of your uh, party members, Crow Armbrust, um, yeah, I think that one is at least more telegraphed because, you know, prof- ugh, I mean, by virtue of Sky First Chapter being the first game, I suppose, but also um, Crow has many traits that I associate with traitor characters. Like, he's sleazy, he's a little bit easygoing, he knows too much, he disappears at certain points, and... Yeah, he, he's aloof and has slightly droopy eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and, and he, he gets unusually buddy-buddy with the main character in a way that, that seems a little forward. Definitely. Uh, but we, we should mention, uh, Trails of Cold Steel is mostly about this, uh, a, a class in the military school, and, and, uh, and I, think it's, I think it's eight kids plus their teacher, and plus they have uh, four senior, uh, senior classmates or, or, or senpai, and uh, and one of the senpai crow joins the uh, j- joins the main class uh, in the second half of the game, but 
basically you spend hours and hours just getting close with your class and traveling the country and learning about the country and also sort of seeing the edges of a brewing conflict between the nobles and the commoners. And there's also a terrorist organization that has been trying to stoke the fire, fires of civil war, and they're led by a mysterious masked man named C. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, I think the only damn character whose name starts with C in the whole school is, is Crow. That, <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that's probably... I believe that's accurate. That's, that, that, <laughs> I'm not, I, I'd have to check a list, but, but that's at least part of it. So it is a little telegraphed that Crow is C and is going to be, be the traitor, but it, it, uh, it culminates in... Uh, Crow's mysteriously going missing the night after the day after prom happens. Uh, him doing things like returning all the items he's borrowed and leaving goodbye letters for everybody, and then at a big speech in the capital city, he 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 shoots the uh, the, the chancellor, the sort of the the, uh, the commoner government sponsored leader of the city, and uh, and appears in a giant robot in a mul in a sort of multi. <laughs> <laughs> in a multi-pronged attack on on a, on multiple cities. So you're uh, so you uh, the main group of students and a lot of the faculty try to de try to defend the the sort of academy town that is the main setting of the game. And there the Reen, the main character finds his own giant robot at the at the bottom of this dungeon side quest that you've been doing for 65 hours. <laughs> And it, it uh and it ends with a clash between Reen and Crow in their giant robots, with Crow just annihilating Reen and leaving him for dead. Right. And so leading for a leading to a you know a uh, a cliffhanger that goes into Cold Steel too. But Crow's betrayal becomes like the the central conflict of Cold Steel one and two. Like like part of Cold Steel two is Reen trying to find all of his missing classmates and finally make Crow answer to his crimes. Right, it, but 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 it, but it all is you know predicated on that big turn near the end of Cold Steel One. Yeah, I think Cold Steel Two, and I like a lot of the stuff that Cold Steel Two does with Crow. I like the backstory they give him because you know Crow mm. at the end of the day. I am totally on Crow's side. Like, by Chancellor Osborne, I hate you. Um, but, uh, I. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I really love the backstory they give him. Uh, essentially, Chancellor Osborne, like, I won't go into it too much, but basically just buys out the entire area, um, the Jurai Economic Zone, I think it was called. And he, like, takes it over and basically makes Crow's grandfather bankrupt and Crow hates it and he wants to overrun it and like that's why he forms the Imperial Liberation Front because all of these people have been affected by Chancellor Osborne's kind of overtakings for so long and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Osborne has a lot of an econo economically and sort of imperialistic uh strategies that have made Erebonia bigger and stronger but ruined the lives of a lot of people living on the frontier and uh and we know that Osborne is definitely if not evil at least over ambitious but uh Rufus Alborea is still a good person through the end. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah, of course he is. Absolutely. I, 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 I believe in that guy forever. There's no way he betrays you. You played Cold Steel 2 and you're still saying that. That's what's mm -hmm. really annoying me. <laughs> I, I remember that. Rufus did, Rufus did nothing wrong. <laughs> Inside podcast joke from a year and a half ago. I apologize. <sighs> I mean, I think Crow, uh, they do undo some of his, and I haven't played Cold Steel 3 or 4, obviously, um, but I think they make Rian and Crow a little more buddy-buddy than I'd like in Cold Steel 2. Um, like, I don't know. Like, it, he... I, I agree with his. I agree with Crow in general, but like, it, one of my problems with Cold Steel Two is it tries to pretend like you as Reen are like playing both sides and just trying to make peace. Yeah, but you're clearly on the path against the nobles, like the entire time. Like you're doing everything to hurt the nobles, and somehow, like it, it, it tries to play it both ways, and it does a very poor job of it, in my opinion. And so that kind of hurts Crow's characterization a little bit for me because I feel like he should be calling Reen out for like, you say you're this thing. But you are a hypocrite. Um, so at least for me. Yeah, I would agree with that generally. I mean, obviously it ends in a way that I, I, I'd still love Crow to a yes. degree, but yeah, it ends in a pretty heartbreaking way. Um, but yeah, I, I have major issues with how they deal with Reen and how he deals with the conflict in general in that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the ending of Cold Seal 2 is a little bit dissatisfying because you resolved. 
Yeah. yeah well, you, you resolve the civil war, like like the 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 fighting inside Erebonia stops, but then the power vacuum is filled by a by. Osborne, who ended up uh, somehow surviving his assassination attempt, and he and he starts going back to his evil ways that ruined the lives of Crow and others, and now Reen is working as a soldier for him. It, it it's mm. really unsettling, but but uh, and I think a lot of the conflict in three and four is sort of like fi- uh, like you know doing what's right and fighting back against your former allies from Cold Steel one and two. It's it's definitely more complicated than that. But that's at least part of it, and uh, and yeah, there, there's still a lot unresolved in the Cold Steel verse. And I think at the end of Cold Steel Four, they said that they're about sixty percent of the way done. So, <laughs> so geez, I think we're looking at a fifteen game series, if my math is right. We're on ten now, so probably. Mm, yeah, so I played two of them. Fifteen, sixteen <laughs> range. I've only played six, and I feel drowned. I've played four, and I'm drowning, but n- not quite at, at Alana's level yet. And which means that Caitlin has been drowned, revived, and is drowning again. And Scott too. Scott too. Scott, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Scott is a bit of a uh, Kiseki evangelist, you could say. Yeah, Sky the Third's the best one. Really, Sky Third? I think so. That's a controversial mm. opinion, though. My, my my favorite is Sky Second. I think two or three are usually the two that are pointed to, right? Yeah. Um, maybe I'm not. I don't, I don't know what the I, 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 I fan, the fandom really really likes the cross build. I was going to say the consensus is Sky Second Chapter or the cross build duology. I would say Sky the Sky third. Second Chapter is my Sky Second Chapter is my favorite. Sky the third straight. tends to be bottom. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Okay. There's no betrayals so, uh, in Sky uh, the Third. Let's uh let's take an exit off this trail. Uh, Nathan, what's another game on our list that we should go over? I think we should talk about Persona, though I can only weigh in on maybe four and five because I okay. All right, recency bias coming into effect here. Do we consider what what June does, or or what the other Maya does in Persona Two to be a to be a betrayal that we got to talk about? Mm, it's not really. I wouldn't but... call either of them betrayals. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't call it a betrayal. All right. In that case, we will not talk about Persona Two. Listeners, please listen to the Persona Two Innocent Sin <laughs> episodes if you haven't already. And let's move. Uh, let's go in reverse chronological order and start with Persona Five. Talk yeah. about a kitchen. Mm. Um, <laughs> talk about pancake. We talk about pancake boy. Mm. I mean, this is a situation. Uh, I'm pretty sure you were going to die or turn evil, like, the moment you meet him. Yeah, absolutely. Be, be, like, yeah. I mean, again, it doesn't help that I played five after three and four, so I already knew, like, from those, like, betrayals. The minute Akechi turns up, you're just like, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you're Phantom Thieves and he's a detective, so it's like, well... Of course, you're like polar opposites, technically. Um, but un- unlike three and four, they don't have the main character and the traitor have the same voice actor. That's true. Yeah. So, so, they, so they didn't give you that uh, tell to work with. <laughs> I'm not a fan of a catchy at all. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I, I wasn't e- either until I played Royal, and now now I'm a catchy. Mm. Yeah, fan. he was already popular before Royal. But um, what happens between the main character, a catchy? And the new girl, uh, I think I think her name's Kasumi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, okay, it's more complicated yeah. exactly uh, who and what all three of those characters are. But uh, but Akechi, it, towards the uh, before the seventh dungeon of Persona Five, or actually no, we're going to run it back even further. Um, in the very beginning of Persona Five, your uh, you and your crew are doing a heist in what appears to be a casino, and you're alone, and you hear your uh, seven um, allies on the radio with you, and uh, it ends up. It ends up you end up uh, um, the cops are called on you. You're captured and thrown into an interrogation, and then you hear one of the cops mention uh, he was sold out by one of his friends. So from the very beginning, you have this inkling of an idea. Uh, one of your friends is the rat. One of the main characters besides Joker is the rat, and it ends up being a catchy who is a kid detective who is, you know, on the, on talk shows talking about the Phantom Thieves a lot. At first he at first they're criminals, but he sort of supports them. He's a little bit back and forth. You're not really sure what to think of him. He does that thing where he ingratiates himself with the main character, kind of like how Crow does. Mm-hmm. Where it's like it's like you seem unusually buddy buddy with me, even though I'm pretty sure that you already know we're the Phantom Thieves. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Nathan mentioned pa- mentions pancakes because one of the big clues that uh, Akechi 
is uh, is the traitor is because he can hear Morgana's voice uh, months before he claims to have gained his, his his persona powers. And really, and you need to be have persona powers and be in the cognitive world in order to think that Morgana is anything other than a normal cat. So that there's there's clues. But uh, it ends up that Akechi has been working for his father the whole time, his father being Masayoshi Shido, the politician who is orchestrating the giant conspiracy that is the central villain for most of Persona 5. But the, the, the most interesting turn of all is, uh, is Akechi's costume and persona. <laughs> low key. <laughs> Where, yeah, he, he, he's looking like some, like, Donny Osmond, <laughs> Freddie Mercury, oh my God. white, white suit with, white suit with epaulettes <laughs> outfit. With, uh, and with his persona being Robin Hood. And then he twists to being some, you know, JRPG boss, tw- like, twisted black tar out, uh, half mask outfit with his persona being Loki, the tricks, the trickster god of Norse myth. So, like, his physical and visual transformation, I think, is more interesting than his plot transformation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how deep I want to go into, like, Persona 5 Royal spoilers, but, uh, the things that happen with the catching in Royal that, uh, that really have changed my opinion on a catching, I think it's something that, uh, Everyone should be experienced if they play Persona 4. All right, and let's go back in time a little bit and talk about Persona 4 for only 10 seconds because we already have a whole episode about this. <laughs> um, if you go a couple weeks ago, we have an episode called uh, RPG Villains, the Persona 4 Killer, in which we talk, in which we discuss in great detail the traitor slash serial killer from Persona 4 and everything, and uh, it's a pretty deep dive. So I don't think we need to talk about him again for this uh, for this podcast and just skip right back to Persona 3. I think there's two characters that we could maybe consider the traitor here. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the first person who comes to mind for me is Shuji Ikutsi, um, the person who it's Ikutsi, sorry, um, who's the person Ikut- who Ikutsuki. Forms, yep, mm-hmm. <laughs> the person it's... who forms seas and is the I think he's the head of the score, isn't he? That you uh, go to something like that. Yeah, I, I believe he's the uh, like the chairman of the school board, not not the principal, which are uh, but but an authority figure like that at least. Yeah. Chief di- chief director of the high school and the chairman and the advisor is. of the uh, seas, which is specialized. Ex- Extracurricular, uh, extracurricular execution squad. Um, yeah, so basically, the main story of Persona 3 is that you are part of a member of student, a group of students called C's, and you are going out. You all have the ability to use personas, and you're basically going out and taking out the first 12 arcana, I believe it is. So you, you've been told by Ikutsuki that you have to take out all of these shadows in order to free the school from Tartarus or free it from the midnight hour. Um, turns out that that's not the case and killing all 12 of them brings out the 13th one called death, which brings back Nyx and causes the end of the world. That is a very redacted version of persona three. Um, but yes, yeah. but, but basically the mentor character says we got to kill these 12 shadow monsters and you do so. While seeing mysterious dreams about a boy and uh, a bunch of other crazy stuff happening, but doing that does not save the world like you thought. It just summons a thirteenth monster who is the herald calling to a, an ultimate destruction goddess that is going to swallow the entire world in darkness. And um, sort of in between killing Monster Twelve and the reveal of Nyx descending, Ikutsuki has this g- complete meltdown. Where he reveals that he's been a sort of a fanatical cultist for Nyx, the, that that uh, that end of the world goddess, the whole time, he reprograms I guess your your uh, your andro- your super uh, android buddy to uh, to take down the whole team, and there's a real dark image scene where everyone in your in your class is uh, is attached to a crucifix, oh, even God. your dog. <laughs> yeah, oh God, I remember this. And uh, and he orders I guess the, the android to to execute you, but then at the last moment I guess resists her programming and stops Ikutsuki, and then you have to sort of get on with the resolution of the story from there. But the other betrayal, which is I don't know le- a, a less obvious one, but still very important, is uh, your classmate. Oh shoot, I, I know he's Pharos in your dreams, but what's his real name? It starts with an R. Oh. Is it, oh god! Is it is it Ryoji or I Ryuji? Want, I want to say that. Oh yes. shoot! I feel bad. No, don't worry. I I'm gonna. I should look it up. I should have looked at. I should look this up ahead of time. You're good. Ryoji. 
Ro, it is Ryoji. Okay, one of, one of my guesses was right. <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've been watching a TV show where the main character's name is Ryo, Ryo Taro, and I knew that was wrong. But <laughs> anyway, Ryoji is a classmate that sort of becomes a transfer student right around where, after you defeat the 12th Shadow. And uh, and un- and uh, until you defeat the twelfth shadow, you've been seeing mysterious dreams with a boy named Pharos visiting you in your dreams. And oversimplifying it a little bit, Ryoji is that thirteenth monster, but he is but he's not aware of it because uh, there had been a death shadow imprisoned in the main character's body, who is represented by Pharos, the boy in his dreams. And after you defeated the twelfth shadow monster, uh, the death shadow left your body and becomes Ryoji. But w- when Ryoji tells you all of this, uh, I think in December f- December 3rd, uh, like in the first week of December, um, and he gives you a month to decide whether to uh, let, let the world end or to try and resist it. But if you let the world end, he'll r- erase your memory so you can you can let it go peacefully. Right, yeah. Doesn't uh, I guess figure it out to a degree? She like senses yeah. something inside of him and yes, you. Yeah. And, and and but Ryoji is not aware of it for the whole time. But the, but then something awakens in him, and, and it becomes very clear to him. And so like when Ryoji tells you that he is the avatar of Nyx and the, he is going to herald the end of the world, it, it's a sad betrayal. Like he's like he won't look you in the eye. He is completely dejected. He uh, he like he uh, I think he apologizes a lot, but is but is resigned to the fact that that's what's going to happen because he thinks it's impossible for your for the, for C's to defeat Nyx. Which is, you know, spoiler, mostly what ends up happening. But yeah, yeah, Persona Three has this weird, like, uh, this weird tone of sort of darkness and and inevitability. Like at the beginning, you have to sign a contract that you will take responsibility for your actions, and people are not really like. Uh, people get apathy syndrome when they're attacked by sh- shadows, which is less like them being murdered or killed violently and more that they're just succumbing to uh, complete apathy and, and just, and just accept it, like, and accepting the end of the world as an inevitability. It's, it's, it's a weird vibe yeah. that is, that is off, that is dark and off for a JRPG that persists through the whole game and, and just, goes to a new level after the after the big reveal slash betrayal from Ryoji. It's it's it, it it haunts you if you uh, if you're invested for the whole way through. That last month is really dour, isn't it? Yeah. And if you play the um the female route on the PSP version where you can choose between a male and female MC, um Ryoji is basically dateable. Like like Ryoji has oh. a romantic I- interest in the female main character and it's not it's not the same as a romance route with like Shinjiro or uh, Akihiko, but like it, there is a slight romantic attraction that makes the relationship between the main character and Ryoji feel a little different. That's interesting. That is, um, I don't know how it's, it's not that explicit, but like it's uh, the reveal from Ryoji feels different with with the implication that he's interested in you romantically. I'm sure it would, yeah. So yeah, that's a uh, a lot of the end game of Persona Three spoiled. I hope you uh, <laughs> managed to pause and skip ahead in time, listeners. But let's see, what is something else we got to talk about? Uh, Nick, Nikki, give us the next topic. How about Apollo Justice Ace Attorney? Okay. Now, the whole Ace Attorney series in general does not have a ton of betrayals necessarily. But there's a lot of impressive character turns, especially within cases, when you realize that, oh, this witness was actually the villain. And you, you, could, you could name probably dozens of traitors slash betrayal slash turns. But in the Apollo Justice, you get a character turn that definitely is a betrayal that starts in Chapter 1 and goes through the final chapter and hangs over the whole game and is really powerful. Let's talk about the Gavin siblings, shall we? Oh boy. (laughs) Now, it's been a a very long time since I've uh, played Apollo Justice, but I still uh, remember Kristoff very, uh, very well. And it's because um, so this is kind of, I guess, a a warning for uh, dual destinies and a spirit of justice, too. Mm, Yep. Uh, Basically, chapters 4, 5, and 6 in the Ace Attorney saga. 
Yeah, like the first three games are like their own trilogy, and then the the Apollo Justice, and then the two on the 3DS are also kind of like their own trilogy, which is really uh really well uh, thought out. I feel I know Apollo Justice, the game gets uh, a lot of flack, um, some rightfully, but um, I, I think uh, the way they tied that all together is really nice, and it all kind of comes back to Kristoff. Because um, throughout the games, and then even more so in Dual Destinies, um, you can really see how um, Kristoff kind of affected Apollo um, as his mentor. When um, Apollo is put on the stand in Dual Destinies, he does the exact same thing as Kristoff. He um, crosses his arms, he puts his head up, and he says evidence is everything in court. He's very... Um, well, like, uh, heavily influenced by him, right? And even, um, Clavier, right? The younger brother, I believe, of Kristoff mm -hmm, yep. was very, uh, influenced by him as well. I believe they, uh, imply that the reason why Clavier drew his hair out was to be more like his brother. Yeah. But it turns out that the brother is, uh, all too eager to murder people. Yeah, um, Kristoff Gavin is the he's the tutorial character. He he's the mentor for Apollo Justice who stands beside him in the first case of uh of Apollo Justice Ace Attorney, which is the first game of the new trilogy, and is like has every appearance to be a very wise, kindly guy. But then at the end of the first case with Phoenix Wright on the stand, it's basically revealed that uh Christoph was the uh was involved in a plot including multiple murders. Mm -hmm. That uh, that in that involves tampering evidence and uh, people way high up in the government and in the court system, and he's uh, brought to justice in the first case. So it seems like he's just the first boss of the game. But then, as you learn more about uh, the the, con the conspiracy, he comes back in the final case, and you, I believe you have to interrogate him in prison. Mm -hmm. And he's brought down not by evidence because Christoph Gavin is a genius with you know, manipulating evidence and the letter of the law, but uh, by a jury trial, because, like, like uh, <laughs> Christoph basically says, you can't take me, there's not enough evidence, uh, and he basically triumphantly says that, that he's untouchable, but then Phoenix Wright reminds him, uh, you remember this is the first experimental jury trial in the history of our country, right? And all the jury is going to convict you, and that's sort of what brings him down. But, and, and the, but then repercussions from that conspiracy from Apollo Justice you know, resonates into the into dual destinies and spirit of justice, as Nikki said. And also, Clavier Gavin, Kristoff's younger brother, is the rival character, uh, the rival prosecutor in Apollo Justice, and he he sort of half blames, uh, half thanks Apollo for what happened to his brother because he admires his brother, and and Kristoff was very influential to both of them, as Nikki said. But uh, his what he did is undeniably evil. So it's the Gavins in general are really interesting villain and rival characters in the second Ace Attorney trilogy. But what Kristoff does in Apollo Justice is a hell of a betrayal. It's really cool. You, mm -hmm. you should listeners, you should play all of those if you haven't. I think that like uh, like Apollo Justice does sort of get a bad rap, but I think that that trilogy each game is better than the previous one. It's it's awesome. Absolutely agree. The uh, last words that Apollo Justice say in the Apollo Justice game end up happening in Spirit of Justice, so mm -hmm. it's it's a really satisfying conclusion. All right, so I'm glad we got to talk about Ace Attorney on the on the podcast. We haven't done that in like two years. So Zach, let's what's the next betrayal we should go over? All right, well you, you called it last time. Let's go ahead and go with it this time. Near OG near OG near. Okay. Are we talking about a, about a certain siblings? We are. Maybe, yeah. um, we're talking about Devola and Popola, and and it goes back to the idea I talked about at the beginning, where like you understand, and actually I think that probably Devola and Popola are before what they do at the end of this game more on the right than you are as the main character. Yeah. Um, so the idea of Nier, and again, spoilers, <laughs> if you haven't played the original Nier and it's coming out again in April, stop listening. Um, so the idea of Nier is that you, um, there, there's a there's an illness that is going around and you play in the American version at least, um, or the Western version, 
um, a dad of a woman or of a girl named Yona who is sick and you're trying to fight, fight these, um, this group of, um, things called shades and you think that they are potentially responsible for what's called the black, black scrawl, um, which makes people ill. Um, and as you, um, are fighting around throughout, you, you, you're sort of guided by these two twins named Devola and Popola in your town who seem to know a little bit more than you do, but you don't really know much beyond that. Um, and it turns out that the shades that you are fighting are actually humans who are waiting to be reimplanted, uh, their souls that are waiting to be reimplanted into you as, um, sort of a, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the right word for it. Alana, oh, what was the right word for it? Oh, God. I'm <laughs> okay. going to get my replicants and my gestalts mixed up, aren't replicants, I? Replicants, yeah. yes. Um, you're a replicant. Um, you're a replicant that it's a shell that is meant to, once the pandemic goes away, uh, you're going to be re, uh, the souls will be reinserted. Um, and it turns out the devil and Popola all along have been working for the shades or the real humans, if you want to call them that. It's, it's always more complicated than that in a near game. Um, <laughs> I, I, but I love, uh, just how, uh, because ultimately their betrayal is of both the replicants and the gestalts, um, because they, um, ultimately destroy everything because you, you destroy one of the twins and then the other one goes insane. Um, and they destroy the project and destroy you as a result. Um, the consequences of that are followed up in Automata. Um, and there are androids who have been sort of fighting for the shades all along. Um, and, and again, they're really the ones who are in the right, sort of, I guess, thinking that our souls as humans are more valuable than souls of replicants. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I love, mm -hmm. I love the way they play with morality in these games and I love, these two characters, especially what they do in Anamata to follow up on it and the way they deal with their guilt yeah. about what happens here. Yeah, really. Um, I remember getting to that end game of uh, original Nier and just thinking, hang on a minute. So if I go through and kill the Shadow Lord, who is the Gestalt version of the main character who has kidnapped your daughter because... It's their daughter as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you kill that that Gestalt, that soul, you have basically killed the last version of that and you have doomed the entire world to... Yeah, you've doomed humanity, basically. And it's so interesting because all this time, you know, it's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to do the best for your daughter or do you want to do the best for the world? And it's just such an interesting moral dilemma to be put into. And the, the twins being traitors really really shocked me i did not predict it i'm pretty good at this i'm i did yeah. not see it coming at all and because they're so sweet and because mm. uh, yeah I, I i i love it it's one of my favorite things about that game which you know everything's phenomenal but whatever um yeah <laughs> I know the music, the story, the comedy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that the twins were the traitors in original Nier, even though I haven't beaten uh, that game, because there are two different uh, twins in Nier Automata, and when yeah. the story is sort of hitting it, the end game, they discuss how two earlier versions of them were uh, were the catalysts for um, all the bad things that uh, that happened uh, yeah. in between Nier and Nier Automata. And and they they have a lot of regret about um about the actions of those two twins, so it's it, it's interesting how it, it, in the moment it's a it, it's a blatant manipulation and betrayal, but at, but afterwards um you know the other siblings of those traitors just are full of regret and it's 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 sad. The ending, the everything near the end of Near Automata is just so sad. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I think the ending is kind of exalting, actually. Yeah. But the end. The end of the original Nier, That's all sad. Well, okay. I, I think that Yoko Taro has a thing for a beautiful tragedy because that's yeah. Yes. A, a, a lot of his writing ends in that way, and and you know begins and continues in that way. Indeed. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to get that Nier remake. I have it on PS3, but oh, oh yeah. The the remake is going to be the opportunity for. I already to... pre-ordered the special edition. I was going to so. say I've got the White Snow edition already. <laughs> Oh man! Oh man! I, I gotta get. I'm gonna get near to a copy of Near uh, uh, when the time comes. April twenty third. Mm. So okay, sticking to October twenty twenty and not April twenty twenty one. Alana, I, I let's 
what's the next game or series we, we're going to discuss? I feel like there's a big one we're missing, and I think it's the Tales series, which I think may be simultaneously the most exhaustive, but... I, I kind of love what they do with betrayals. Like, nearly every game, it's a joke. Nearly every game in this series has a traitor, you know? Like, even yeah, if, it, yeah. You, you, you want to talk about some anime betrayals. <laughs> T- Tales of is, is extremely anime and has a betrayal in more than half of the games, I think. Okay! Yeah, and I think, like, Kane is the original traitor, I get it. But, like, the first traitor who always comes to my mind when he was like, oh, you know, video game betrayals, it's Leon Magnus from Tales of Destiny, I think. Um, just for the sheer, like, again, in the same, in a similar vein to, like, Kane, he is, uh, has been manipulated by his father, who in turn has also been manipulated and possessed by a spirit in a swordian, which is a talking sword, um, and talking sword that gives the user magic powers yes that's right <laughs> and so for the whole game like leon i think the first time you meet leon he arrests you if i remember correctly and puts you in prison and then he's kind yeah. of forced to watch you along the whole way is that right he's like a he, he's like a knight captain in one of the kingdoms and uh he like when you negotiate your way out of imprisonment he sort of accompanies you as like your chaperone mm-hmm. for a mission and then he joins your party more permanently but he's still, you still think of him as like a knight captain from one of the kingdoms in the game. But then, it's but then like after you get a sacred artifact and it's lo- it looks like that the kingdoms are 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 doing a good thing. Um, Leon's father, who's a wealthy industrialist, basically him and his son betray everyone and uh, and take the artifact and start the you know the world shaping uh, evil end game. And Leon dies sort of holding you off while his father escapes. He drowns, doesn't he? Yeah, and I think it's yeah. really interesting that he's one of the only ones we've mentioned on this list that actually doesn't really get a redemption at all. Like, Oh? Mm? Yeah. He, no, well, he, no, well, no. Oh, well, not in that game, yeah. right? Okay. Okay, yes. Okay. All right, because I'm, I'm, the, the conversation does not stop with Tales of Destiny here, but let, let, let's continue. Yeah, so I think, and I think this is what the Tales series is a bit guilty of. Same with Trails. Um... Many of the traitors get a little bit of a redemption arc, and it's all buddy-buddy and everything. Leon doesn't get that until Destiny 2, when they literally revive him and call him Judas to make it really obvious that he's a traitor. <laughs> um, yeah. First of all, the, the mask that he wears doesn't even cover half of his face. Right. If, if, if you've played Destiny 1 and then you go straight into Destiny 2, the Japanese Destiny 2, because oh, yeah. Destiny 2 is a different thing in in North America. It's confusing. We're sorry. Uh <laughs> But like, like uh, b- basically, Leon dies um, defending his father, who's straight up evil at this point in Destiny One, and he he did that because his father was holding the girl that uh, Leon loved hostage. Yeah. Uh, and even though Leon's uh, biological sister is one of the one of the main party members, uh, and he knows that, but, yeah, but he and, doesn't and, tell yeah, And Leon knows that, yeah, Leon knows that. But I don't think Stan or Rudy do. No. Um, but then in Tales of Destiny 2, uh, there's a sorceress mm-hmm. who's sort of manipulating timelines to, to suit her, her wants. And she revives Leon uh, at the beginning of the game, uh, like, I think before the story even takes place. And it, uh, you learn about it in cutscenes or something. But uh, Leon revives. He's like, why did you revive me? I should be dead. He refuses to work with her. And puts on a mask and renames himself, and uh, he eventually gets named Judas. I don't remember. I don't know. I don't know if he chooses it or someone else does. But it's so painfully obvious it's him because you can see his full face. He's he's holding. He has like the same sword he had in Destiny, and he named himself Judas. I mean, come on, come on. it's it's extremely obvious. But <laughs> but he has a different colored cape. So oh, it's true. Yeah. The same character, oh, right? Man. Like, there's no way. Yeah, you, you don't just give up on a pink cape like that. Like the like. The, no. I mean, it, I mean, the Dragon Quest three hero said so. It's like, no, you you you're, you're wearing pink. <laughs> you're staying in pink. Exactly. Oh, definitely. Um, but, rather than go through, sorry, rather than go through it, every game in the series, I want to know oh, if man. anybody has a favorite game or a traitor in this series who has played enough of them. I suppose. Um, let's see. Well, my favorite to make fun of is Alvin and Zillia. But, <laughs> He's but my, my favorite. But, uh, but, yeah, but, but my about. actual favorite, I think, is probably uh, Raven and Vesperia. Oh, yeah. I like that one, too. I think... Oh, I'm so annoyed that I didn't get this one either when I played it the first time. Like, it seems so obvious when... Raven or Alvin? Because you oh, have to God. blind. Yeah. 
You have to be blind not not to guess Alvin is the traitor. But I think Alvin is really interested in Exilia because this is what I really like about it is that it's not you're not trying to find out he's the traitor. You know he's the traitor. You know he's working <laughs> for Exodus, which is a group of people who for him uh I'm going to spoil Exilia for you now. Um, um, he's working for a group of people from another world. Um, Exilia does the two worlds thing. Uh, the other world, I've forgotten what the name of it's called. Uh, thank you. Yes, it is. Like yeah. Um, so they're from Olympias and they, they're basically, they were on a cruise ship that crashed through a schism in the, in the, uh, barrier that protects the two worlds. And all of these Olympians came over and, uh, Alvin's father died and his mother got really sick because of some really terrible things his uncle did. And his uncle is manipulating Alvin to, um, he, she got really sick and he, um, his uncle had the like cure for it. So he kept giving it to her and said, right, if you work for me, I will keep healing your mother. But if you do any, if you don't, then I'll let her die kind of thing. Um, so Alvin is kind of forced into a corner and has to do it. But like, Alvin's a bit of a disaster in that he basically tries to, he, he like makes friendships and then like destroys them through what he does. Like one of the villains in Exilia is Pressa. She's one of the four Chimeriad, which are like the weak version of the, uh, oh, the god generals from Tales of the Abyss. Um, I uh, love it when they give you a numbered, uh, group of villains that are all like in a weird hierarchy. It's like whenever I learn the name of a new enforcer in a Trails game, I get yeah. excited because it's, I don't know, it's, it's, I think it's the Tokusatsu fan in me. Just just give me ranked numbered groups of villains <laughs> to defeat one by one, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they, they dated and he betrays her and she, like, she goes out of the way, her way, when you like encounter her in game with Jude and Mila, she goes out of her way to say, you should not trust that guy. Even though she's fighting you, she's like, you should not trust Alvin. And Jude's like, no, I trust him. It's like, Jude, come on. He's going off to toilet breaks all the time. How can you do this? Like, literally. Like, yeah, it's like, he'll, yeah, guy gets mess, the guy gets messenger pigeon. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, he'll get a messenger <laughs> pigeon, then says, oh, I'm going to go get a drink. And then you see a cutscene <laughs> in first person with a bad guy talking to someone in the shadows. And it happens like five times. It's incredible. It's, <laughs> it's so nakedly obvious that he is that he's going to betray you, but uh, but uh, Jude continues to believe in him. I, I didn't finish Zillia, but I was. I, I don't know if there's been a Tales game where I've yelled at the main characters more than this one. No, that's fair enough. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I yelled at Luke von Fabre a lot. You do, yeah. That's, that's appropriate, I think. I don't know. I love Alvin to bits though, just because he's so messed up. He's been through so much that. He's so warped in his mind that he thinks that he's doing the right thing in a way, but it, it, like he's having a conflict with himself. And if you, mm, this is dependent because you can pick between Jude and Mila. And if you pick Mila, you get a lot less. You get certain parts that are shown off to you more. Like you have certain conversations with Alvin with Mila at certain times. But there's a really important part of the beginning of chapter four, which is probably my favorite part in the entire game. If you pick Jude. Um, that has a confrontation between Jude and Alvin, and I think it really, really sells Alvin's kind of conflict. I mean, he's definitely not the best traitor in the series, but I've got a massive soft spot for him. I I should restart Zillia because I am interested in that game. I, I haven't beaten a Tales game more recent than Vesperia, but I, I kind of want to pick Mila or, or, or Milia next time because the best character in the game is is her hair. And I, I just want to—I just want to get more of Mila, of Mila's hair. Make... I think her hair doesn't operate. Mm, in nope, it's it's, a, it's its own character. It's it's like Joe Musashi's scarf in the Shinobi remake. Yeah, um, but yeah, this series is <laughs> notorious. Um, you said Raven. <laughs> I I want to talk about Raven for just a minute because what he goes through is also pretty wild. Uh, throughout Raven. He does the thing that he has droopy eyes. He see, he gets too buddy buddy with the main characters. You, you sort of suspect that he and he clearly knows more than what he's aware of. He seems to know all the goings on in the military and in the guild system. But what's really happened is that he's high up in the military and the guild system because of something that happened as a younger man. Um, uh, he, he, his real name is Schwan. Which is a little crazy when you get that reveal because sh you mentioned the Schwan Brigade. You hear the Schwan Brigade mentioned and Schwan being a hero of the military several times over the course of the game. Like, like, oh yeah, Schwan is a guy. Maybe we'll end up fighting him or something. And the f and Schwan died 
in a uh, a battle that had a large cover up before the start of the series, and uh, but then a uh, oh, oh what, what's the word for the for devices of magic power in in this uh, blastia. A blastia, yeah. A blastia is inserted in him that keeps him alive, and uh, and he basically becomes a like he maintains being Schwan, uh, working for the military, but also becomes sort of a secret agent of the government with this new persona of Raven. And as Raven, he gets involved in the guilds and gets becomes a high ranking member of the guilds, and also secretly helps Yuri and Flynn and the other main characters of Tales of Vesperia. And temporarily joins their party, being you know an, an open robed, ga- a lazy weirdo that fights with a bow and a sword. His it's weapons, weird. A little, his so weapons, compli- to control. Yeah, it's hard. To, he's weird to control, and it's even weird to explain just just watching him fight. But basically, Raven is a dead man who's being kept alive by a device in his chest, who's playing both sides, uh, and and is. But you, but one of his sides is is known for almost the whole game, but not revealed until a boss battle in like I don't know around the three quarters or two thirds mark. It's uh, I, like I I sort of believe that Raven would be, was a traitor, especially since he knew so much so much more than he let on. Yeah. But I was still shocked that Schwan ended up being him. Yeah, that was the reveal that got me. I think I knew he was going to do something, but I didn't ever put two and two together. Especially when you're at the Weasand of Carlos, you know, when you're running away from the desert and um, you're going mm-hmm. back to Nordopolica and uh, Raven which, which, does... Is, which, is where, which is where the battle that he died in took place. Near, yeah, near there. Mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah, it's at Mount Temza. And um, Raven like stops and those two soldiers that you do like all the tutorial fights against, they're from the mm-hmm. Schwan Brigade, and he puts on a voice and I still didn't, and they stop, and they're like, yes, Captain, and I still didn't pick it up the first time I played it through. Yeah, it Ra- like... Raven is a black bird, and a swan or schwan is a white bird. They they give you plenty of clues. <laughs> There's foreshadowing here. But, I was an uh, idiot. Yeah, but uh, but I was I I was really uh, like I really like Vesperia, especially their cast, and I think that uh, Raven is uh, like like his, his betrayal. And and his redemption, I felt I thought felt pretty earned because he was being manipul like his loved ones are being threatened and he was being threatened to have like the thing inside his body get turned off or removed if he uh, if, if he betrayed his superiors. But they, they ended up finding a way around that. But like the, the whole team basically reaccepts him with his apology uh, near the end of the game. Kind of, but they all just hit him and then it's okay. And I'm just yeah. like, no, 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 hang on a minute, like no, no. That's not fair. Oh, and also he complains about aches and pains through the whole game, and uh, and, 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 and 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 you think it's because he's in his thirties, but really it's because his body can't catch up to the blastia inside of him. Yeah, I know. I've been a bit <laughs> it's, unfair. It's still yeah, funny, that was though. a. I thought that was a nice touch. Yeah, me too. But anyway, we're over. Uh, we're past the seventy-five minute mark, so I'm going to talk about one more game at length, and then we're going to end the episode. Uh, so we're only really talking about ten games or series for uh, traders, but I. We, we could go on longer and longer, but I'm just going to do one last one. And that's the game that I am playing literally right now, or I should say literally a few hours ago. But um, I've been playing Yakuza 1, or I should say Yakuza Kiwami. Okay! Which is this, uh, only the second Yakuza game I've ever played. I, I played Yakuza 0 for this podcast a few months ago. and but, but it got me interested in the rest of the series, so I started up Yakuza 1. And the whole game is about, is about a betrayal. And uh, playing Yakuza Zero, and then seeing this, who were in which the traitor is a major character and not a traitor, only for this whole game to be about these two best friends completely destroying their friendship is 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 be- is incredible to behold. Uh, the main character Kiryu, and uh, and his best friend Nishiki or Nishikiyama, but they all call him Nishiki, are uh, have, have we grew up in the same orphanage and uh, and grew up and like joined the Yakuza at the same time. And a bunch of stuff happens with their mutual friend Yumi, who's a, a girl from the same orphanage, and uh, a, a Yakuza boss sexually assaults her. And Nishiki, who uh, is, goes to the scene first, shoots and kills the Yakuza boss, and Kiryu arrives a few minutes later, grabs the gun, and tells Yumi and Nishiki to get the hell out of there. So Kiryu takes the fall for Nishiki's crime, killing a Yakuza boss, and goes to jail for ten years. And when he gets back, instead of Nishiki, like thanking him or trying to help him. It turns out Nishiki has been slowly rising in the ranks through a series of murders and betrayals and now wants to take over the whole Yakuza organization and frame Kiryu for it. And, like, how you arrive there is 
amazing. Like because Kiryu still still uh, trusts Nishiki. Like Kiryu didn't have to take the fall for the murder Nishiki committed. He could have just let the police catch Nishiki and continue being a yakuza. But he cares so much about Nishiki and Yumi that he took the fall for him. And over the course of the game, you see flashbacks of Nishiki like accruing a large medical debt and uh, hearing superiors saying, "Man, I wish that you, that uh, that it was Kiryu here instead of Nishiki." Because and there's even a metaphor on the tattoos on their backs because because Kiryu has a dragon tattoo on his back and Nishiki has a has a tattoo of carp going up a waterfall and there's a it's folkloric in Japan that if a carp fl- uh, gets to the top of a waterfall it can become a dragon. Where like Kiryu is sort of the better person and the tougher person and Nishiki is kind of a screw up and is always being compared to Kiryu, and and, and Nishiki just ten years. Of people not believing him and people and and him feeling resentful about Kiryu, basically make him go from being the genuine good friend from Yakuza Zero into a power hungry monster who is who will kill anyone and do anything for more power in Yakuza One. And me playing Yakuza Zero, where where Nishiki is just like your best friend who helps you get out of trouble a couple times, to this person where the entire plot of the game is. Is, is like is, is Nishiki's revenge plot, and uh, and 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 trying to track down Yumi and Kiryu, trying to fight off Yakuza that still think he killed the that Yakuza boss from the from the beginning flashback. It's amazing. The, the entire game is a is about two best about of like about one person betraying his best friend, and it's just so powerful. I'm I think the game has twelve or thirteen chapters, and I'm on chapter seven. But I cannot wait to play more of it, and hopefully punch Nishiki in the face a lot. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get to. I mean, I'm surprised. Maybe I'm not surprised because this is one Yakuza One, isn't it? Right. So mm-hmm. yeah, this is, I'm playing the remake of Yakuza One. Okay, so I'm wondering whether this is going to happen again because you know, Kiryu seems to get himself into lots of the same situations. Or you know. yeah, there, there's a, a lot of. Uh, um, something happened years ago and now it's coming to a head and Kiryu's in the center of it. And a lot of character turns that are surprising. Uh, and some betrayals. There, there's some minor betrayals in Yakuza 0 that are sometimes just misunderstandings and sometimes much more powerful. But Yakuza 1 is entirely about this betrayal, how uh, K- Nishiki resents Kiryu and Kiryu would do anything for Nishiki and that just makes Nishiki furious. Like it, there, there's cutscenes uh, or flashbacks to what happens to Nishiki during the uh, during Kiryu's imprisonment, and Nishiki just keeps getting compared to Kiryu and keeps finding setbacks, and he just gets more and more pissed off, and uh, it culminates in him instead of like welcome welcoming Kiryu back with open arms like brothers, just determined to end Kiryu's life. It's it's the worst, but I <laughs> definitely want to punch him. A lot of shirtless punching in the Yakuza games. A lot of uh, two men staring each other down. They both somehow take over, take off shirts, jackets, and undershirts with a single motion, and then they start punching each other. So if you're you're into that, then that's the series for you, let me tell you. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. I I kind of want to play all of them now, which is, I think, a feeling that our mutual friend John O'Logan had about a year ago. It was. Yeah, but I, I don't know how far I'll get, but I'll at least play through Yakuza Kiwami because I have to see that betrayal through to the end. And speaking of going through to the end, oh my god, we're at almost 90 minutes. And look at the rest of this list that we have here. Uh, Danganronpa, Tactics Ogre, Pokemon Black and White, Xenogear, Xenoblade, Octopath, Baton Kaitos, Seventh Saga, Lunar, The Silver Star, Dragon Age, Bi- uh, Mass Effect, Jade Empire, that's the Bioware corner, I guess. World Ends With You, a bunch of East games, uh, a bunch of Disgaea games, Diablo. There is a lot of traders we didn't cover, but I want this episode to stay under two hours and not hit all the way up to 20 hours. So <laughs> hopefully, listeners, we haven't ruined that many games or series for you and just you know having fun talking about our favorite our favorite traders and betrayals uh if you think there's one that we missed or really should have gone to please send us an email or bug us on discord or co- even comment on the uh, rpg fan main website because now that now news articles can have comments isn't that wild it's 2020 kids yeah wow we're, we're behaving like 2006 and 2020 Maybe we should have added dig.com links to all of our news articles. <laughs> so, uh, 
<laughs> uh, listeners, thanks for listening to us. Uh, thank you, Alana, Nathan, Zach, and first-time panelist Nikki for joining me on this episode. Um, we have a lot planned for the rest of 2020, but let's stick to October for now. Uh, next week, we are doing an episode to accompany a feature. Uh, Zach, you spearheaded the feature that um, that was trying to find out the best RPG of every year. There was even a, a, a large vote, both by staff and by listeners or, or readers. Um, That's true. Yeah, and, that, and we're publishing the written version of that very soon. I think it'll be I think it'll be in the next several days. We're in the first week of October right now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so listeners, you uh, if you can't read that feature right now, you will be able to soon. But we're doing a podcast to accompany that feature where we look at all of those lists of games that came out in every year and try to determine the best year for RPGs. Uh, we're gonna it's a top ten list where we just discuss ten years in detail and why they're the best years of RPGs and count down from 10 to 1. So if you want to find out what the best year of RPGs is, listen to next week's episode and read that feature once it hits uh, sometime in the next several days. Uh, later this month, after the best year of RPGs, we're doing two episodes on Fantasy Star 4. It'll be the first Genesis game I complete that was not with friends at a sleepover. Okay. And I- <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I, I've I've only just started it uh, a few days ago on my Genesis slash Mega Drive Mini, and it uh, it looks great. It's been fun for the less than 100 minutes I'm playing it, but uh, but I'll, I will definitely have more to say in two weeks when we do the first of those episodes. And also coming in November, I think I can announce this now. Um, it's Ladies Night at Retro Encounter because we are doing Final Fantasy X-2, the sequel to the second game Retro Encounter ever covered, and a uh, a PlayStation 2 game that's been remade for every PlayStation since that uh, has really, really pretty menus, and other than that, I have nothing to say until we record those episodes. But if you have uh, comments on the best year of RPGs or Fantasy Star 4 or Final Fantasy X-2 or Traders or anything at all, please email us, retro at RPGfan.com. That's the best way to find us directly. You can also check out the main website, RPGfan.com, comment on the boards, comment on pages, visit our Facebook page, our Instagram page, our Twitter page, our Discord server, our Twitch channel, something streaming every day on those Twitch channels. And if you search for RPG Fan or RPGfan.com, you can find all of the ways we were presented on the internet. Uh, and we also have three other podcasts. There's Random Encounter about randomness and every uh, sh- and posted every two weeks. Rhythm Encounter about RPG music and also posted every two weeks for the first time since 2017. We're all thrilled about Retro Encounter about excuse me. We are thrilled about Retro Encounter, but we are also <laughs> thrilled about Rhythm Encounter's return. <laughs> <laughs> and also Phoenix Edge, our affiliated podcast that is uh, weekly and mostly focuses on current events. You can review Retro Encounter and those other three podcasts on iTunes or Google Play or whatever podcast listening venue you use. Please rate, review us, give us feedback. We love all of it. So before we sign off for Real Real, let's tell the listeners how they can reach us individually, starting with you, Zach. Uh, you can reach me via email at ZachW at RPGFan.com or you can find me on Discord at ZachW. And Alana, your turn. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Alana Hagues. I am on RPG Fans Discord as Alana, or if you want to email me, my address is Alana H at RPGFan.com. And Nikki, tell the listeners where they can find you. Nowhere yet. <laughs> All right. That's weird, because I'm pretty sure I follow you on Twitter, but we're going to let that slide and move on to Nathan. How can listeners find you? Uh, you can find me at uh, Smashing27 on Twitter, and I'm on our Discord, and I'm on my name on there. All right, so from Nathan, Nikki, Alana, and Zach, do we figure out who the traitor was? Or do we, fin- we complete all of our tasks in time? Uh, Who's the imposter? I still have tasks left over. <laughs> oh, no. Hmm. Well, there's, there's five of us left. Maybe we can finish them in time uh, before we... Oh, no. Are you going to die before you give out your social media? Is that the problem? <laughs> at the real monsoon, at Evoker for dogs. Good night. Good luck. Baka no tai, kodomo na no ne, yume wo otte kizu tsuite. うそが下手なくせに笑えない笑顔を見せたいらぶよもろくに言わない口下手で<音楽><音楽>